During the last quarter of the 18th century and the first quarter of the 19th century, the colonial British officials brought about far-reaching changes in all spheres of Indian life. The most sweeping of these changes were wrought in the agrarian sector. These changes were very complex in nature and often contradictory. Dismantling the old feudal structure, a new semi-feudal structure was gradually put in place. The peasants' traditional right to occupancy over land was abolished. Slowly but steadily, land became a commodity, alienable private property. The catch word for the early British colonialists in India was plunder. They aimed at extraction of the maximum surplus from the peasants' produce. Revenue and not the welfare of the peasants was what they were looking at. They introduced three different land revenue settlements in separate regions of India under their control. These, however, differed only in form and not in content. The ultimate policy was maximization of land revenue. In the preceding lecture, Professor Amit Bhattacharya had discussed the permanent settlement that was introduced in Bengal in 1793. It gave rise to a hitherto unknown form of landlordism based on ownership of estates. The peasants were shorn of their traditional right to occupancy over land. The new landlords almost became the masters of the peasants' lives. In the present lecture, Professor Bhattacharya will discuss two more forms of land revenue systems introduced by the British. Rightory settlement was introduced in Madras and Bombay presidencies. Uh, uh, it is true that uh, the company acquired land uh, around Madras as early as 1750. Uh, in 1765, it, uh, for some reason or other, it made no serious attempt at the direct collection of land revenue. They were busy probably in eastern India, more busy. And it was only after conquering the Baramahal and Salem districts from Tipu Sultan in uh, 1792 that the company first attempted to administer the land revenue policy and surveys were made in the countryside. Uh, surveys of fields owned by or possessed by individual holders, uh, assessing the land revenue on each holding, collecting the land revenue directly from the landholder, all these things had started. And uh, this, this particular uh, system uh, owes a lot to Colonel Alexander Reed and Thomas Munro. This settlement, Raitori settlement, was introduced in the Baramahal between 1792 and 1798, in Coimbatore in 1799, in some districts which were ceded to the company by the Nizam of Hyderabad in 1800, uh, regions like Bellari, Anantpur, Kurnul, Kudapat, etc. And the Karnatic districts in 1801, meaning Nellor, North and South Arcot, Chitor, Madura, etc. Now, the first two decades of the 19th century saw repeated changes and there were often unsuccessful experiments in the matters of collecting land revenue. And it was finally uh, it was left for Munro to reintroduce the Rayatwari settlement throughout the Madras presidency during his period of governorship from 1820 to 27. That is why we, the period is 1820 to 27, though it started earlier, a bit earlier in, in, in different regions. Uh, Elphinstone, who was the governor of Bombay presidency, introduced it in 1819, some time after uh, the defeat of the Marathas. Now the officials believed that in these regions there were no Jaminders uh, with large estates. And so there could be no Jaminder settlements. 
So it was decided that a settlement should be made directly with the riots. That is the peasants or the cultivators. And under this system, the riot was to be recognized as the owner of his plot of land, subject to the payment of land revenue. Again, subject to the payment of land revenue. And it was a temporary settlement. It was not a permanent settlement. And it was to be revised periodically after 20 years or 30 years. That was decided. Now, in Madras, uh, Monroe's new settlement fixed the land revenue at half the gross produce, 50%, on unirrigated dry lands and three fifths on irrigated wetlands. And the incidence of land revenue varied enormously from one district to another and even from one village to another village. In Bombay, on the other hand, revenue assessment was not made, as in the case of Madras, on the basis of gross agricultural produce and calculations regarding the cost of production. In Bombay, fertility of land and market price of agricultural produces were given priority in assessing revenue upon the rights. Now, under the right to worry settlement, the holding of the riot rather than a large feudal estate became the basic unit. Holding of the riot, small holding of the riot for the fixation of revenue. And it was raised from time, an amount, quantity was raised from time to time. And the demand was pitched so high that in the Bombay presidency, for instance, peasants were subjected to cruel and revolting torture uh, to force to force them to meet the revenue demand of the state. Uh, coming to the Madras presidency, uh, we have uh, Arsidat. Arsidat wrote that the use of torture was almost universal in the province for the realization from the, ex for the extraction of land revenue from the primary producers of the soil. Now, however, what is important is that the right to settlement did not bring about a system of peasant ownership, though it was concluded with the peasants. And the peasants soon discovered that large numbers of jaminders were replaced by one giant jaminder, and that is the colonial state. It was the colonial state was the, which was the jaminder, which acted as appeared to be the jaminder, the largest jaminder. But as the land revenue was very was exorbitant, unbearable, they could not pay the amount, and so they had to part with their land. Because that was the condition. You have to pay revenue on time, and unless that was done, then you will have to uh, part with your land. That brings us to the last one, that is the Mahalwari settlement, which was introduced in uh, 1822. In fact, uh, it was introduced, uh, of course, later than uh, permanent settlement and a bit later than the territory settlement also. Now, the northwestern provinces were acquired between 1801 and 1803 by cession and conquest. And this settlement was introduced in parts of central India, in the Punjab and in the northwestern provinces. The first serious attempt in the settlement of revenue was made by a person named Holt Mackenzie, who was a secretary to the government in the territorial department. And it was he who had given shape to the Regulation 7 of 1822. And in one sense, it was a uh, Mahalavari settlement was a modified version of the permanent settlement. Accordingly, according to that settlement, the land revenue was made neither with the great hereditary revenue farmers like the Bengal Jaminders, except in a few places. There are some exceptions also. Nor with the peasants, as in Madras and parts of Bombay Presidency. The new regulation permitted the government official to form settlement with all the co-sharers in mahals or estates, 
that is, uh, who were the owners of the mahals, uh, owners of the village communities, or a few representatives of the village community, or the heads of families, or landlords. So there were many people who were associated with the mahal. So it was uh, the uh, settlement was made with the owners of the mahals, with the owners of the estates. And uh, it was decided to fix assessment upon every field and upon every resident right. And the state's share was fixed at 83% of the gross rental. 83%. That was the quantity, that was the amount. And uh, like other settlements also, the settlement of 1822 was also plagued by overassessment. There was much overassessment. And pressed from above by demands for increased revenue, the revenue officials, they always uh, sc uh, screwed the assessment up to the highest possible figure to extract the maximum surplus from the peasants. And here also the land revenue was periodically revised and the peasants were subjected to same kind of oppression and torture. Now, there were three main uh, features of the land revenue systems introduced by the British in three different regions of India. Uh, the first feature is that the land tax and the rent, which was appropriated by the British bourgeoisie through the colonial state missionary and its intermediaries, that is the native landlords and usurers, took not only the entire amount of the surplus labor, but also a part of the necessary labor of the peasant. And the peasant was not only ground down to the barest uh, minimum of means of subsistence, but that barest minimum, he was also deprived of that barest minimum also. So, everything of the surplus product and part of the necessary labor, necessary product was also taken away from him. That is the first thing. It is applicable to all, all the three regions. The second is that, that the rent that the direct producers paid to the landlords uh, and directly to the colonial state was not the capitalist land rent which represented an excess over profit, but the typical rootless feudal rent. No question of profit, everything. If an, if, if an important part of the necessary labor, that was also taken away. And the third point is that the appropriation of the land tax and rent by the colonial state and the landlords was in the main coercive. It was forcefully uh, taken away, extra economic compulsion was there and it became more and more intensified than ever before. Now in a new climate, usually money lending uh, experienced a phenomenal growth. Uh, we know that uh, demands were placed, demands were made by the colonial state on the jamindars, on the peasants, all the owners of the mahals. And in order to meet the exorbitant revenue demand or rent, uh, the peasants were forced to borrow money from the money lenders. They were forced to do so. And in fact, the money lender, the usurer, they made it comparatively easy for the peasants, both the peasants as also the landlords, uh, to pay the revenue within the specified debt because they were there to with the money and usurers were usurers themselves were also landlords usurers when it is not that they were not landlords but they were also landlords in colonial India usury capital sided with colonial power and serviced the mechanism of tribute extraction. Side by side, it also caused 
disintegration of the small peasant economy and ruin both the peasants and the artisans and there was no way to escape from the control of the money lenders because whenever they were in need of money they would have to look to her they would to borrow money and the only person from whom they could borrow money were uh, was the money lenders and nobody else and in fact he would rather get into debt by mortgaging his land then he would part with the, his own land but once he was in debt once he borrowed money he became indebted and once he was in debt it was virtually impossible for him to get out of it because it would not be possible for him to pay off the debt it is not that just the principal but the interest amount and the jamindars and uh, the money lenders they also forged their signatures and since they were illiterate they didn't know what actually was written on the paper on the piece of paper where he signed where he gave the thumb impression he could not sign he gave the thumb impression and so the result was that after a point of time he had to part with the land because he could not repay the money this way money lenders became landlords they became jamindars because they became the owners of the plots of land so there was the parasitical growth of usury in the indian countryside and it led to debt bondage bondage some type of debt bondage now besides bonded labor a new kind of serfdom also arose in the countryside uh, with the penetration of commodity money commodity money relations into the countryside the ownership of land was being increasingly transferred from one hand to another from the peasants particularly to the hands of the usurer come uh, landlords new uh, generation of landlords traders they were also traders not just landlords and uh, when the peasants were forced to sell their holdings or when they or when they lost them to the uh, mortgages they were not driven off the land but they were employed in the same land as sharecroppers they were tilling the land which at one time belonged to them but now they knew that that land no longer belonged to them it now belonged to someone else and the usual landlords seize most of the products the surplus or all the surplus products as also much of the necessary products without virtually making an investment so this type of parasitic landlordism flourished uh, throughout india after the introduction of the three land settlements the permanent the right to and the mohalwa sir what was the difference between the surplus product and the necessary product uh, necessary product or necessary labor uh, it is uh, that part of the product which is necessary f- which is the barest minimum needed for subsistence for the peasant subsistence and surplus product or surplus labor is that portion which is above that that is uh, which is more than what was necessary for his own maintenance for the, that is it is more than the barest minimum it is more than the barest minimum now the colonial rulers they extracted the surplus product total extraction and also a part of the necessary product which means that the barest minimum also he was deprived also of part of the barest minimum so so uh, it was not possible to maintain himself in such a situation it is not possible to maintain himself so that was that was a typical feudal form of extraction which leaves nothing for the peasant okay sir how far was the colonial rule beneficial uh, when we uh, dealt with the impact of colonial we uh, dealt with the impact of the three settlements we have we have seen that uh, 
it was hardly be, it, it can hardly be called beneficial because the because the three land revenue settlements were made with the sole purpose of strengthening colonial rule first of all to have a stable source of land revenue uh, to extract more and more from the primary producers of the soil and then also to create a social a pillar one of the main pillars of colonial rule so that uh, they could help they could strengthen colonial rule they could uh, give advice suggestions and uh, they could uh, uh, protect colonial rule from attacks from other other parties other uh, indians also so uh, colonial rule can hardly be called in this sense it can hardly be called be be beneficial and we have po we have seen that uh, uh, the, the situation in the countryside was that there was a the development of money lending usury capital debt bondage then a new type of softum uh, and uh, the destruction of the productive forces someone said that colonial rule would, would initiate would, would uh, lead to the development of new productive forces but how can new productive forces develop in a situation when there was nothing left for the primary producers of the soil there was nothing left hardly anything left so it was this impact was totally negative it was totally negative the, if it was beneficial then it was beneficial to the colonial state it was beneficial to the collaborators of colonial state it was beneficial of course to the jaminders but not to the basic masses not to the people because it was it was a development of the co of the metropolis at the cost of the underdevelopment of india so it can hardly be called beneficial for the indian people and now we will uh, make a brief summing up of what we have analyzed so far uh, we have uh, dealt with the three main settlements the permanent settlement the right way settlement and the mahalwari settlement three settlements in three different parts of the country and we have argued that instead of playing any revolutionary role uh, all these settlements made the indian society move further backwards rather than forward thank you